Welcome to the next episode of Dark History. Here we talk about the things you don't necessarily learn in the classrooms, the very bad things that have happened in the past. Today's episode is on postmortem photos. Here I have photography teacher Miss Rupert with me. Hello. Hi, how are you? Excellent. Good. So have you heard of postmortem photos? I have. Oh, I awesome. Have. So those are actually my favorite types of photos just because, you know, dead bodies. Um, are pretty awesome. They are pretty awesome. In their own weird way. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Okay. memoriam for um, the dead or the deceased people. Um, and it was practiced mostly in the 19th century. Um, didn't really matter if it was like late or early. Um, most, most of the time, it was like mid. But um, yeah, mainly it, it became a thing in, um, it became a thing in the 19th century postmortem if the body is clear um, because there is no movement at right. all. Um, and it's especially easier to notice if there is a living family member near them um, and their body is completely blurry because photos were not taken as fast, obviously, as you know. Um, and, you know, uh, the bodies would be just a bit blurry from natural movements like twitching, um, breathing, casual movements. Um, and the dead person can't move because they're dead, so they'll be absolutely clear. Um, so, yeah, those are postmortem photos, um, and they're creepy. It's pretty awesome that you're into looking at archaic styles of photography. Mm -hmm. um, I totally geek out on that aspect of the photographic process. Today we're into the digital era and things happen so quickly and imagery seems to be something that sometimes we don't even pay attention to, especially the print or the idea of the actual preciousness of the one image. So when we talk about postmortem photography, it's something that was able to allow for the middle class, the poorer classes, to keep a memoriam mm -hmm. of a loved one. Right. So prior to the photographic process coming into place, which would have started to kick in around the 1830s, um, in 1840s and 50s, there was something called the daguerreotype, which was very short-lived, but then kicked into um, a style of photography that we see in the Civil War, where we start to see the first imagery of um, battlefield and um, almost journalistic style. And we can come back to that, but the idea of the postmortem was something that came from when a family didn't have a lot of money, to create an image, a painting, a drawing of themselves or a family member, you almost waited till mm -hmm. they died and then took the photo. This photo photographic process wasn't cheap and it wasn't quick. Um, that early process of photography was something that was considered wet plate. So everything had to happen at the exact time that the photograph was taken. The actual coating of the plate, so creating the image, the negative, um, taking the photograph and then processing it. Mm -hmm. Where nowadays all that does happen in the digital camera, back then it would have needed more or less like a darkroom space that they would have carried with them. Mm -hmm. So here you've got a family that doesn't um, or can't afford to ta say create a painting, but they can afford to spend a little bit of money on an image of their child or a husband um, that passed unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So the photographer would come in with all of this chemistry and camera gear, and um, you'd pretty much set up your your loved one. They'd prop them up. Um, I think you have a photograph of a young boy with this kind of apparatus behind him. Even the portraits of living. Were, would use these hand head holding almost like a clamp for the neck. It would go around the back of the neck to keep the neck still. Because as you mentioned, um, the the people that were alive might be blurred in the photograph yeah. because the the uh, image took so long to take. Now we take a snapshot, meaning it's a snap of a second. And back then it would be anywhere from five to thirty seconds for right. an image. A house was dark didn't have electricity, right? So you often wanted to take it either outside in an open studio space or near a window. So you had enough light and then the image could be quite a few seconds long, which would mean that if you're trying to take a portrait of a living person, you often saw blur in the photograph. Um, so yeah, postmortem, if you start to take a look at the pictures and see 
uh, how they were trying to represent them as almost living beings, right? Where you paint those eyes back in or you'd have them situated in a way that they almost look still alive. And this was kept as a memoriam, as a remembrance of the individual that they lost. Uh, these are pretty cool examples. Yeah. And it's pretty neat to see some of the modern versions that you have, like of Marilyn Monroe, who's yeah. all sorts of starting to decay. So that right. beauty that we think of her is no longer there. And, and she's, uh, you know, bespeckled with uh, discoloring and, um, you know, the eyes shut and you know, the hair slicked back. It's, it's not a flattering photograph of her in any way. I'm not oh, sure she'd be not. very happy about it. Oh, she definitely <laughs> would not. And I, I personally really like um, the more modern um, post-mortem photos just because you see these people that you know since there's many of famous people that you could look up online and Marilyn Monroe was viewed as this beautiful sex icon um, very very gorgeous very uh, personable and then you see this photo and it's she's almost unrecognizable like you just you can't even no you can't tell it's her you can't and I was all. even shocked when I first saw it I was like wow she looks like an average person right which is freaky to me um the first postmortem photo was taken during the American Civil War, um, and it was taken by a Scottish photographer, a pioneer named Alexander Gardner. Um, and I guess that's what really sparked it. Um, maybe it's not the first, but it's um, most notably the first very widespread known postmortem photo. Post yeah, I think of war, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think there were postmortem photographs taken of individuals prior to that point because yeah. the Civil Wars in the 60s, 1860s, so by then you're, you've are you already started to see um, photographs taken of individuals, but mm -hmm. the Civil War marked the first time the photographers were able to almost follow the front mm -hmm. and capture what is now considered the first journalistic documentation of a war. Yeah. And here they are, right, in the 1860s with what was a dark room in tow. Mm -hmm. So you have this giant uh, covered wagon, which was really wood, and here they're carrying all their glass plates, right, because when they're photographing um, at this time, it's considered wet plate, it's considered um, what they call an ambro type, which you can create a negative from or allow for it to be a positive. Right. So these guys are taking their entire dark room with them into the field and photographing the aftermath of a battle. And interestingly enough, I think there's less than a hundred mm -hmm. postmortem photographs from the Civil War, all told. Yeah. Um, it is what we start to think of as the the war itself. Um, because it was such a fantastic shift in understanding how to experience war for those of us on the home front, right? Uh, they were published, and it was the first time that individuals saw what war looked like, mm -hmm. and they had a almost an imaginary vision of the, um, you know, heroic concept of a battlefield and what that might look like probably from etchings and illustrations. Mm -hmm. But to see the dismembered, bloodied, you know, um, you know, bloated young men left on the fields of battle was a whole new experience for the American public. Right. Um, so O'Sullivan and Gardner and Brady, three very prominent photographers at the time, all from the north, mind you, right. uh, interestingly enough. So most of what we see are photographs from Antium, um, from Manassas. So those are the places that we see these imagery of the, the men left on the battlefields. So, okay, so they get there. They have their dark room in the, uh, you know, wagon. They have to set their camera up. Um, I know there's some rumors about these guys kind of posing photographs. I think there was only one that was proven to have uh, a gun moved around, but typically what we see in Civil War photography is actually what they found. Right. They were true to the journalistic, uh, you know, tenant of allowing for things to be as they were. And they would set their cameras up, they would compose the shot, and more or less have to guess on the exposure time depending on if it was an overcast day or a sunny day. And then they would go back to this, you know, dark room in essence and coat a plate, a glass piece of, um, you know, shaped 
rectangle, four by five, eight by 10 inches. Mm -hmm. Very different than what we think of like film from a 35 millimeter camera. Right. They'd have to coat it in the dark. So you'd pretty much have this black cloth around you or you'd walk into this tiny little closet of a box inside your wagon. You'd coat the plate, slide it into a canister um, or a film holder in essence, mm -hmm. and you'd carry that outside. It was light protected. And you would place it in the camera. You would then take the lens off, the lens hood off, right? Expose the image for anywhere between, you know, five and thirty seconds again. Mm -hmm. Put the cap back on. Put the uh, cover back on the plate, and then take the whole apparatus back into the dark room. And you would actually uh, develop it right there. The whole process would take about fifteen minutes. Right. To take one photograph. That's Shocking. And then you would have, right, either a positive, um, which you could use. Uh, so here's an example of a glass plate positive, oh. which you can't really see unless you put a dark plate behind it. That's so pretty. Right? Isn't that pretty awesome? So it's almost like an engraving on glass. Right. And then once you put the dark plate on it, you see the negative version of it. Yeah. So you could take this now that it's cured and set um, from the field, the battlefield, mm -hmm. and it could be printed as a positive image onto a piece of paper, on a light sensitive piece of paper, right. and shared, or given to an engraver who then creates an engraving of it. Mm -hmm. So the publications that were in circulation at the time were able to either use the image as a negative or pass it on to an engraver who then created um, engravings, which is just an etching, and then you could make multiple prints from that and share visually what's happening during the war. Right. Uh, so a fascinating turn for the public to be able to see what's happening on the battlefield. Uh, that transitioned into World War One, and we started to see images. World War Two was definitely transformed um, in regards to how we explored death on the battlefields mm -hmm. and how the public responded to that. Um, journalism became a very influential in affecting public sentiment right. during that time. Um, and I know you even mentioned, you know, Vietnam. Yeah, the Vietnam War was um, one of the last wars broadcasted because it devastated people completely. Um, yeah, the imagery was very gruesome by then. The cameras yes. could capture the action. They were fast enough to actually keep up with moving people and showing what was going on in mm -hmm. regards to almost live time. Right. World War II, we saw the first photographers on the front capturing action as it happened. And then, of course, then at Vietnam, you saw what was occurring in the fields and in the jungles. Right. So you mentioned to me that you are very interested in postmortem uh, photography, obviously, since you, you've given me so many facts. Um, and my dad um, has always prided in being this, like, well-renowned, creepy dude who loved everything <laughs> horror. But it was actually my mom, who is more this um, antique uh, seller lady, um, who actually showed me postmortem photos, and she loves those photos too. Um, and she has a few of them, I think, still. Um, and I immediately fell in love with it. So amazed that I have spent literal hours looking at postmortem photos of just, um, like, random people or even famous people. Um, and like I said, Marilyn Monroe's is also my favorite, but Ted Bundy's is like one of my absolute favorites as well because he was he died by electric chair. And hmm. sometimes like you would think like I wonder what the body looks like after that. It's gruesome. But um yeah. So that's that's like so cool to me that you could like see people after they died, especially on the internet, like it's so accessible. You can find a lot in national um Photographic Archives holds a lot of imagery. There's a photographer that is a modern-day photographer, Sally Mann, who actually, uh, after the death of her father, became very fascinated in death, decay, what happens to the body. Right. Ooh. Near where she lives down south is an area that is used for one of the universities as a forensic study mm -hmm. space. And so... Um, she asked permission to go into this uh, farm, in essence, and photograph with her 8x10 view camera. It was a very large camera, again, very similar to something they might have used during the Civil War. Right. And she put them on plates, uh, 8x10 uh, negative plates. She used older cameras. This 
farm is an area where people have donated their bodies to science. That's so cool. And they are in various states of decay. So here she is, a photographer of today. Sally Mann's very famous for her early photographs of her family. Mm -hmm. She's very connected to her family. So, of course, the passing of her father really affected her. And it just turned her into this individual kind of fascinated by what goes on with the body. I think when her dog died, she even um, had him, she saved his skin. And mm -hmm. then the rest of him she put in a cage and allowed for um, the flesh to decay. And then she photographed the bones. Wow. So all of this is a couple year process of her finding her way to, you know, creating images like this where... It's just this, you know, putrid, bloated body laying in a field. Uh, the students at the university use this to study what form of decay a body might be in. So right. for police to be able to walk up and find, uh, or, you know, a body in the field or in a trunk or set somewhere, how long have they been there? Um, what's the state of the, the the larvae or the maggots that are kind of breaking down the right. flesh? Um, all of this is uh, visible in 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 this forensic farm, mm -hmm. um, and she photographed it. She commented about the stench. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it must not smell too great. <laughs> <laughs> rotting flesh, oh, I, yeah. I doubt. Oh, that's um, fascinating, right? Yeah. The texture of it, the you know, and the fact that she used an archaic style of photography to even photograph it mm -hmm. gives it almost a reference to the Civil War photography. Too. Yeah. Here they're wrapped in a sheet, like what would happen if a body was dumped in a in, in you know with fabric around it, mm -hmm. um, and even the staining and the coloration of the body as it starts to break down. Different size bodies. Some are very obese, and some are very thin. Mm -hmm. um, they're all tagged. Like you can see, there are tags. Right. There are scientific tags identifying who they are and what's going on. Um, so yeah, postmortem today. Uh, there's the skull. The flesh is totally eaten off of that. That's so. Um, but it's, yeah, that's a modern day photographer creating work that's published in a gallery. Yeah. <laughs> and it's probably not like the most appropriate to say, but in a way, it's also very like beautiful just to see like how how the body decomposes and I feel weird just saying it but like it no, really if is. No, you can separate yourself from the idea of it being like I think we associate death um, as a negative where so much of what art I think does, what photography does, what science does is pay attention to it uh, through a different lens mm -hmm. so that we can look at it for those textures or for the conversation about what's happening. Right. You know, what is it that we're trying to identify? Photography shows us this moment in time, almost disassociated from the, you know, chronological sequence of time itself, which is also very fascinating to look back at a Civil War photograph and see these young men and think of them, you know, on the dirt of Gettysburg. Right. Um, and what does that mean in context to today? Mm -hmm. Or these bodies um, set there and, you know, looking at um, how we all end up breaking back down. Yeah. You know, we all end up breaking back down into the earth. So right. pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, pretty cool. It is really cool. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this episode of Dark History. We hope you enjoyed listening to the podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it.